dangerous. He's got dynamite in both fists. This is a big fight for boxing fans all around the world. Uh, how to exploit Joe's um, weaknesses and, and recognise his strengths. Frank Warren suggested that the winner of this fight will go on. I'll just start off, Anthony, right? Uh, yes, please, Ed. Sorry, I didn't know whether you could speak with that mask on. Protocols. <laughs> Good, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome. This is becoming the familiar way to do things. So nice to see so many of you online. Those that have their cameras on, welcome. Those who have their cameras off, we know what you're doing. All right. So it's, uh, it's good to see you ahead of another week. It's quite remarkable, actually, that during a pandemic, we seem to be running a show every single week. I think we're busier than ever. I think the cards are stronger than ever. And I think the, the running till the end of the year is definitely the strongest I think we've seen for many, many years, of course. We're just coming off the back of, of Connor Ben and the week before that, a history-making card with Katie Taylor. This Friday, of course, Daniel Jacobs against Gabe Brasado and a great card underneath it from the Hard Rock Casino in Florida. And then, of course, next week we go into Billy Joe Saunders' defence of his WBO World Middleweight title. Then we go into the Unified Heavyweight World Champion, Anthony Joshua, against mandatory challenger Kubrat Pulev. And then a little another surprise coming later, probably with a record defence from Gennady Golovkin. And of course, already confirmed as well, December the 19th, Canelo Alvarez against Callum Smith. So it's a fantastic run into the final uh, stage of this year from the zone. And I'm looking forward to the card this weekend. I mean, we have a great card from top to bottom. I think one of the most exciting young fighters in the US at the moment, Nikita Ababi, is in a nice step up. A really interesting heavyweight fight, 2-0 and against 8-0. Uh, Majidov, the, one of the standout heavyweights from the amateurs, of course, uh, taking a big step up and moving very quickly in his career against Delgado, who's 8-0. Really good, interesting uh, lightweight fight between Emmanuel Targo and Mason Menard. Anyone that's seen Mason Menard knows he's all action. I'm hearing a lot of good things from uh, Peter Kahn and Lou DiBella against Emmanuel Targo. Of course, he's highly ranked with a WBO, pushing on for that mandatory position. And then a great fight, big step up for what I feel is one of the best young talents in world boxing, in Olympic gold medalist Danny R. Yulusinov against former unified world champion Julius Adongo, who broke the hearts uh, on a matchroom show when he beat Ricky Burns to unify the division and, of course, fought Terence Crawford for the undisputed championship. And then... I think a great matchup. I love a bit of bad blood. I love two characters and personalities. And Daniel Jacobs against Gabe Rosado is certainly that. You know, on paper, you expect Jacobs to, to try and come through this fight in style. I know Gabe Rosado has put everything into this camp. It's his last big roll of the dice. They don't like each other. There's a little bit of personal pride as well. It's Brooklyn against Philadelphia. And I think it will be a great fight, a great build up this week. Plenty of spite in the action. And I'm looking forward to it. And I thought I'd come on here today to talk about the card and give you guys a chance to grill me for any other questions you might have. So over to Anthony and uh, for the procedures for questions. Okay, thanks, Ed. Uh, Donna first, please. Hey, Eddie, how's it going? Good, mate. Uh, uh, I was wondering, uh, we just heard the news from the government that there will be people allowed up to a thousand indoors at indoor arenas in the UK starting on December 1st in particular areas. Does that impact the AJ and, uh, and Pulev fight? Are you looking to maybe get some fans into that event? Well, certainly if it's possible. I mean, I think the big catch on that is the tier system. You know, and what will be what tier, where, how... And, and what qualifies for what? I mean, there is a chance they could put London straight into tier three, which would mean we have no crowds. Obviously, if it falls into the tier two category, then we would be able to have a thousand people at Wembley. Um, just going back to the question, yes. Uh, depending on what tier is what and what we're allowed, obviously, we don't know if London's going to be put into tier three, but certainly... If, we, uh, if we're allowed to, if Brent Crouch will allow us, then yes, we'll be doing everything we can to get that thousand number into December 12th for AJ against Pulev. Eddie, before I let you go, I wanted to ask one quick one. What is your take on the Tyson and, uh, and Jones fight coming up this weekend? And I want to know, are you getting a piece of the action from Jake Paul fighting on that? No, definitely not getting any action from Jake Paul. Um, I don't know. 
I think it's hard to criticise people like Mike Tyson and Roy Jones. You know, I think they've done so much for the sport. I just feel that I like to remember those guys when they were young and at their best. You know, I just, I just hope that it's not, you know, a sad spectacle. You know, hopefully they can just have a bit of fun with it and I wish them all the best. Thanks, Donald. Reggie, next, please. Hey, how you doing, Eddie? I'm good, Reggie. A hey, quick question, just looking forward a little bit. I know, you know, great action this weekend, but, you know, you've been a, you've championed the value of the zone to uh, subscribers and whatnot. I just wonder, could you speak to, we're getting to the end of the year. Uh, if crowds can't make it back before spring and summer, you know, any concerns or thoughts on what you can achieve with next year's schedule? Well, I think it's very challenging, Reggie. You know, I mean, look, we are going to be at the Alamo Dome and we will have crowds for Canelo against Callum Smith. Um, you know, if we can uh, secure the, the Gennady Golovkin date, we may try and get crowds there as well. We're putting together at the moment a schedule where we don't have crowds. And I think we've got a model in place that means that elite boxing can continue. I mean, if you look at that sort of one month period of schedule on the zone, obviously you have Jacobs Rosado this weekend, but, you know, December 4th, you have Billy Joe Saunders. December 12th, you have Anthony Joshua. December 18th, hopefully Gennady Golovkin against Zerometa. December 19th, Canelo against Callum Smith. January the 2nd, Ryan Garcia against Luke Campbell. I mean, that's a hell of a lot of action, you know, for obviously an annual subscription of less than 100 bucks or even a monthly subscription of 19.99. I think you guys, you know, are having to shell out another 75 bucks for Errol Spence against Danny Garcia. You know, you've just shed out 75 bucks for Javonte Davis against Leo Santa Cruz. And before that, you shed out 75 bucks for Charlo. That's over three months. That's $225. That's a huge amount of money. And um, we get criticized all the time, Reggie, in the UK for 30 bucks, you know, for an AJ fight. So you guys have got it tough. I just feel that we got great momentum. Obviously, it was a huge catch making the Canelo Alvarez, Callum Smith fight on the zone in December. And I think it gives us tremendous momentum going into the new year. But certainly when you look at fights that are scheduled for the, probably the first quarter, which is a Chocolatito against Roman Gon- sorry, Chocolatito against Estrada, for example, that's a fight that should be selling out the StubHub or the old, you know, StubHub arena there in LA. It's, it's a, it's a wonderful uh, Californian fight night or even in Phoenix, you know, it can sell out arena. Uh, Demetrius Andre against Liam Williams in Providence. You know, we just did nearly 8,000 in Providence previously for the Selecki fight. And obviously the winner of of Luke Campbell against Devin Haney, uh, sorry, Luke Campbell against Ryan Garcia against Devin Haney. You know, if it was Ryan Garcia, Devin Haney against Ryan Garcia sells out the Staples Centre. You know, if it's Luke Campbell, that fight sells out in the UK or or possibly in, in Las Vegas. So we want the crowds back. You know, there's nothing like the feel of live crowds. But the good news is, is that we're sustaining a fantastic schedule and we're keeping the momentum of the sport regardless of, of no fans at the moment. You think they need you down in, uh, in, in Florida? Are you missing being there to oh, add? Your- one. Yeah, I'm going to, I'm going to come out. The main problem is the isolation, right? So when I come back to the UK at the moment, I have to isolate for two weeks, which means that I miss a number of events here and, and pretty much would mean that I would miss the AJ fight, you know, which I can't do, but I will be coming to America for the Canelo Callum Smith fight. They're actually reducing the quarantine down to five days from the middle of December. So that will help me greatly. And obviously it's Christmas as well. So that's a big fight for Matram uh, being involved in, in, in that promotion. And obviously Callum Smith is our guy and we've, we've promoted him from the, uh, his debut. So yeah, we'll, we'll be there. I miss it. You know, I miss it like crazy. I hate not being at shows and this will be, I think the third US show that I've not been at and the guys have been doing a brilliant job over there, the USA team. You know, it's not easy at the moment, not just with no crowds, but obviously the protocol, the testing, you know, the, the keeping the fighters safe and uh, the, the team there have been doing a fantastic job. Thank you. Uh, the Boxing Source next, please. Yes, there, Eddie. Following up on these questions, how has it been going from, you know, fight camp over the summer to booking these fights at these venues with no crowds and, you know, working with uh, people there within Metro Boston USA? Like, have you gotten used to it? And how has it been as far as like not having fans in these venues? Well, 
fight camp was something pretty spectacular. I was actually watching a fight back from fight camp last night, just thinking, wow, I can't even believe we did this. Like, you know, it was a really unique environment. It is, it is quite sterile in these venues. You know, I've always tried to keep away from doing boxing in a studio because I don't feel like it, it gives you that big event feel. We've been in Wembley Arena, which is a huge arena. We've booked that out for the last six weeks. And in, in the US, you know, we'll, we've been at the Hard Rock. We've done a great job uh, with our team there to make sure that, you know, at least you're in a big arena. It feels like a big event. It is difficult. You know, it's interesting that all the fighters I've been speaking to are all saying the same thing, which is it hasn't felt any different. Sometimes I don't believe them when they say that. But I've, I've enjoyed as a, as a purist being part of the production of these events to bring the fans something different. You know, you hear a lot more of the shots. You hear the interaction of the corner team and the fighter. You can hear the referee. You know, you can hear the fighters breathing at times, but nothing will ever take away, you know, the thrill and the buzz and the excitement and the energy of a live crowd. So I hope that, you know, it's going to be, I'm, I'm very excited about going to, to Texas uh, and seeing live crowds back. Obviously, I saw it for the Santa Cruz fight with Javonta Davis and, you know, you, you get jealous and, and we seem to be on the verge here in the UK of bringing a small number of fans back and we hope that escalates you know, through a reduction in, in the numbers but ultimately through a vaccine, I guess, is when the government's going to be in a, a strong position and a comfortable position in the UK to let uh, fans return as, you know, in, in, uh, in full. Thank you very much, Eddie. Hi, Eddie. Uh, thanks so much for taking time to talk to us. You know, obviously, with there's been a lot of changes in the way people promote these fights in, during the pandemic. So how much have you can been kind of taking the lessons that you've learned from uh, promoting in the UK and in the US with no fans and kind of taking that into these upcoming Canelo Callum Smith fight? And how much do you kind of look towards that fight with fans and think of it as some sort of blueprint for when you're going to be able to do more shows with fans in the future in 2021? Well, Carlos, we've learned a lot because, you know, we've had to adapt and we've had to think outside the box. You know, every time that you make a major fight, I mean, Canelo against Callum Smith is a good example. You know, you bring the fighters together, you do a multi-city press tour, you know, you bring all you guys out, you know, we get a load of action, loads of footage, and we can drive a lot of hype. And obviously now we're geared more towards the digital side and the tech side, which is, you know, stuff like this, but also about content, you know, and working harder to engage the fans with shoulder programming and, and digital content as well. And we've got a lot of that dropping over the next couple of weeks with Canelo and Callum Smith. There is no doubt, there is no question that a lot of the key moments have been taken away from the promotion of the show. Like I said, that that initial start of the press conference, the weigh-in, you know, where you can get live, live crowds in, open workouts, you know, every Canelo Alvarez fight has a traditional sort of welcoming ceremony and the arrivals coming into MGM there. And those kind of events are big spectacles to really drive the interest of the event. So we've been learning a lot. Um, you know, the main challenge now is when we're dealing with venues or in America's case, states that will allow fans back. It's not just, yeah, they're allow fans, just, just throw them in the arena. You know, there's a, there's a method to it. There is safety elements to it. This has to be, policed by our security team to make sure that there is social distancing. Obviously, with the Alamo Dome, you're going to have around 11,000, 12,000 people in a huge arena. But, you know, it's our job to make sure that we enforce the plan that it's safe for fans because, you know, we do know that um, it is dangerous right now, you know, to, to con certainly to contract this disease. And we have to make sure that we do everything we can. It's not just a case of bringing people back. It's a case of bringing them back safely. And that's what we're working hard to do with the states and the commissions as well. But it is important to start making those moves to bring fans back because I don't think that there is sustainability for everyone in the sport without fans, you know, especially the smaller hall shows. You know, the, the, the small hall and almost what you guys call like the club fighting scene is really driven by ticket sales and, and fighters selling their... 200, 300 tickets to pay for their purses and enable them to get on. Right now, that scene over here, and, and especially with you guys as well, isn't thriving. 
you know, because it's very costly for promoters to continue running those shows. So we've learned a huge amount and it's been, it's been really interesting. I mean, you know, painful at times, but I think it's going to put us in a good position when we have normality back and we can use the information that, that we've, we've learned during this and, and the ways that we've changed promoting. And, you know, like I said, combine that with the return of, of live crowds. And I think when we come through this, we'll be in a much stronger position. Thanks, Eddie. Hey, Eddie. Uh, thank you for, uh, for taking the time to talk. I uh, hope all is well. Um, kind of looking at the current situation, sorry to beat a, bed drum, beat a, de- uh, a dead drum. Obviously, with the, the current situation in the U.S., numbers are skyrocketing. Um, I know that Florida and Texas are allowing fans to come back into an attendance, but does that put you in an ethical dilemma of, is it in the best interest to do that, considering the CDC is saying that, hey, don't get together in large groups? How, how do you work with that? I think we follow the rules, firstly. I mean, I, you know, when you talk about morally and ethically, you can't do that without the science and the information and everybody will make their own decision. It goes back to my comments to Carlos. You know, it's not just, oh, we need fans back. You know, let's just bring everybody together. We're working diligently with the state and with the Athletic Commission to ensure that is done in a safe way. Obviously, the Allardyne Dome is a huge arena. You know, one thing I think that you saw too much of in, you know, and this is putting pressure on myself and my team in the Santa Cruz fight was everyone came together. You know, there needs to be a stricter policy in place where, you know, we yeah. will be presenting to the state and the commission and our security team. Oh, okay. right now, but this is, done. we can get it. Okay. Yes, right. you know, why not? Right. Right. Thank Can't you. Right. Thank yeah. you. Now. Jose, turn your phone off, mate. Come on, get it on mute. And, um, you know, we will be presenting to them a, mm-hmm. Jose, come on, Jose, mm-hmm. put your phone on mute. Mm-hmm. Jose, come on. All right. Anyway, we will be presenting to them a, a safe plan, you know, to do it. We have our experts. We have our medical experts on the team. Ultimately, the state will make their decision. Um, and, you know, again, it will be making sure that it's in the best interest and the safety of the spectators as well. But I'm definitely of the fact of we've waited a long time. You know, we could have brought fans back in September. You know, we could have, when we did... Estrada Quadras, when we did Chocolatito, when we did Julio Cesar Martinez, we could have done that in Texas, but we chose to do that in TV studios in Azteca because we just felt that we weren't ready to go through the process. The blueprint has been done, not saying it was perfect, but, you know, PBC made that move with Santa Cruz and, and Tank, and we have to keep that momentum going now, but it does have to be safe for the people that are attending. Thank you, Eddie. Uh, Matt from Behind the Gloves, please. Hi, Eddie. It's Matt from Behind the Gloves. Um, What I wanted to know is, have you had a response from the government with the letter that you sent in relation to grassroots boxing? And also, what type of impact do you think that funding will have on the communities in this country? So the answer is no, initially. I don't really expect one at the moment. I think I'll I'll do everything I can to help, but obviously England Boxing are behind this, they're pushing this, they're driving this, and and that's the authority that's going to provide a blueprint for the funding to funnel down to the community. So it's, it's very easy for me to come in and say, yeah, you should be giving money to clubs. And then the government says, okay, so how does that work? We need you know, a public body like England Boxing that will enable that system to work. What I'm trying to do is create awareness and get some momentum. You know, I'm always baffled by the lack of funding that goes into boxing clubs within the community. And this isn't about, you see, and when the, the, the bill came out of the rescue fund for sports and they're giving 135 million to rugby and what was it, 40 million to horse racing and 6 million to motorsport. You know, all sport is great, but those sports, you can't even compare the impact they have with the next generation and the community to what boxing does. But the problem is, and it's not an attack on politicians, but they're so far removed from that side of the community. And, you know, we all are like, maybe if I wasn't involved with boxing, I wouldn't have a clue. 
what boxing does at grassroots level. But anyone that does understand boxing, anyone that's seen it with their own eyes, knows that it ticks so many boxes for the British government. Like, even if you don't like boxing, even if you think it's brutal, you know, you look at the government policies and what we're trying to do right now in this country is tackle obesity, you know, within younger people. Box ticked. It's improved mental health. Box ticked. It's reduced gang crime and knife crime. Box ticked. But more importantly, it instills discipline, manners, respect into that younger generation. So this is much deeper than sport. This is trying to improve our country. So I feel that if people understood, if people went, if people spoke to people, if people saw it with their own eyes, there is no way you couldn't provide funding for boxing clubs in the community. But the frustrating thing is, you know, these guys, they, they don't understand and they don't visit and they don't know. So I don't know whether they'll do anything. I do believe there is another round of support coming for sports, but it's difficult for them because everybody's asking. And that's what I said, you know, in my letter, it's been difficult to keep boxing going at the elite level. We're not asking for any help. We'll be okay. The community clubs won't. They're closing down. They won't reemerge. You know, we're all creatures of habit, right? If you're a young kid and you've been going boxing every week for the last three years, and then all of a sudden you don't go for eight months, you, you just, you fade away. You know, so it's really important to not just bring this sport back, but make sure these clubs can have the opportunity to keep thriving and keep doing a, a remarkable job in the community because they all really do serve a very special purpose. Brilliant. Thanks, Eddie. Hey, Eddie. How you doing? Hey, Danny. Um, it's Daniel Dubois, Joe Joyce on Saturday, the night after your show. I just wanted to get um, A, a prediction from you and B, where does the winner sit in that long queue to face AJ? Um, first, it's a good fight. I mean, you know, and an interesting fight. I think that the problem is with Joe Joyce is you watch Joe Joyce and you say he's absolutely terrible, right? But obviously he's not. He's, he's extremely fit. He's extremely durable. But we, I keep going back to the fact that he gets hit a lot, a lot, you know, and he got hurt badly to the body, by Bryant Jennings, you know, in the opening stage of that fight. And Daniel Dubois clearly hits very hard. So I think Joe's got to be careful in the early stages of the fight. We don't, I mean, they're both, I mean, certainly Dubois is a, is a complete novice, really, in the heavyweight division. Um, and Joe is as well, but Joe is obviously more experienced, especially through his experience of, of the WSB. So I guess, like, the sensible thing is Dubois early or Joyce to weather the storm and, you know, not expose him because I, I think Dubois can fight, but, you know, just sort of outlast him, if you like. Um, there is the sort of comparison between Dubois and maybe an early AJ where they're strong and muscular and in time, as AJ has done, he's learned that actually you better to be a little leaner and you know, concentrate on your boxing more than just your strength. Um, I think if you ask me to have a bet, I think I back Dubois. Uh, for, for stoppage with, you know, within six rounds. But I, I wouldn't be surprised if, if Joyce can weather that early storm. But he's got to be careful because all these guys can punch and Dubois can definitely punch. So um, Joe just, you saw even against, who is it for? Wallach, you know, in his last fight. And he got hit a lot in, in that fight. So I'm not sure. It's an interesting fight. In terms of where they sit, I mean, the winner will be British and European champion. And I think that's about right with the level they're at at the moment. I think both can go on and, and be world champion contenders, but they've definitely got a few more wins to, to rack on the resume to start fighting for world titles. Although, you know, the winner could end up fighting Usyk for a vacant world title. So interested to see what happens in that one on Saturday. Thanks, Eddie.